Hello my friends, finally time for another tutorial. It's been a while and I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to get started again with this sim. It's what we're going to base today's little tip on. So you might wonder, how do you do this effect? I um, am pouring liquid and it goes inside a collider and it stays inside a collider. So it's not magic, it's not demon or anything like that. Uh, I created another more recent example so in order to show you how to set this up it's actually really simple it's only the fact that collisions these days work differently than what they used to and what I mean by that if you've been paying attention to my tutorials previously you have heard me say that on the off occasion you might want to go back to the standard particles. And why is that? Because the standard particles are not, you know, uh, GPU accelerated, they're not as efficient, and um, they uh, take a lot longer to sim. Sometimes, especially if you're doing uh, uh, viscosity stuff, you can go up into the hundreds of substeps per frame. But, um, you know, collisions these days, if I take a diverso object and I collide it with this sphere here, so this is how collisions work. They take the mesh and you define it either as solid inside or solid outside. So basically now RealFlow has detected this is an airtight volume. And so everything on the inside of this object is going to be considered a completely uh, solid collision object. There's no way of like having it halfway there kind of uh, so either you go solid on the inside or you go solid on the outside and solid on the outside means that particles can be emitted inside of the volume but there's no way they can escape that volume the entire rest of the scene is being considered as you know a concrete block uh, so this is the only kind of space that particles are allowed to live in and the third option would be a non-airtight object such as uh, an object that is open, like the cube here, and it's detected and it's set to shell by default. So then, well, really terrible uh, voxel size here, but it proves the point still. Um, this is all just considered, um, you know, a, a sheet of geometry. And obviously I would have needed to turn up the, uh, the settings, so it wasn't so chunky, but you can see that it has walls and it collides with you know, this is a, a band of voxels and it's going to collide with them. There's no other kind of flexibility to this. And what I mean by that is if we take a standard particle object, shuffle it over here, create another collider. And you'll notice one thing specifically, and it's that uh, there's no domain. There is no domain when it comes to standard particles. The particle sequence cache that comes out of this simulation is only going to be relating to this circle emitter. So if I create an additional emitter, it will be an additional particle cache. There are ways of kind of combining those if you need to, but I mean, you can just use a mesh object and bring them into the same mesh or something, but you can use a binary loader, uh, but that's really extracurricular, but that's something you would use to combine them into the same cache if that's easier for exporting or delivery or whatnot. But the real difference here is uh, that this way of looking at colliders is computationally uh, more efficient, but it's uh, slightly less flexible. And the only thing I did in the K example with the white fluid going inside of the K and staying in there is only the fact of using one single uh, attribute, really. So if we look at this collider here, you'll see that it has diverso particles interaction. So it has distance, friction, bounds, sticky roughness, and interaction factor. If we look at the sphere, on the other hand, number two, it has a lot more settings. So we can recognize these attributes and if we look up here, there's something called tolerance and collision normal and distance tolerance. A few different attributes that relate to the fact that they're actually looking at the very polygon and the point of impact from each every particle as it hits. And that's obviously a lot more computation to do and that's why it's less effective. But it also allows us, for example, to pick a collision normal. So this is really interesting. I can say, you know, you're going to collide with both the in and the outside. 
And that means that, you know, uh, if a particle uh, comes flying here, and let me actually delete this stuff now. And let's, for sake of an example, create another emitter and put it on the inside. So if I have this set to both, you'll see that the particles that are flying on the outside have no way of escaping the sphere. They're stuck inside. And the particles in the inside have no way of getting into the sphere. They're stuck outside. But what you can do is then pick inwards or outwards. So if I pick outward, any particle that hits the surface from the outside is going to collide, but particles inside of the sphere are allowed to escape. And if you've been paying attention, you probably figured out already that setting it to inside or inward would be the other way around. So they're not going to collide with the outside. They're just going to fly straight through. You can see that. No effect whatsoever. But now, once they reach the inside, there's no way for the particles to actually escape. And the only fact that is making the liquid actually uh, collide and, and flow outwards is the fact that they're colliding with the particles that are now stuck inside. So we can just make this a better example by scaling up the sphere somewhat and maybe going slightly higher on the resolution. Now we should be able to see that and I can actually turn off the sphere entirely. And that is really it, actually. It's a really simple thing, but it really allows you to do pretty cool stuff. And if I if I stop emitting a little sooner than I was doing, and just let it fill up slightly, and then I'm just going to do this live now. I'm not going to set up any keyframes for anything. I'm just going to say speed is now speed is now zero. So no new particles, and all the particles in the inside are going to collide with the inside. And I can also take the liberty of creating a gravity and keep simulating a few frames and it's all going to fall down and collide with the inside of the sphere and that's all I was doing really and the letter K uh, letting them flow in and stay in and it would gradually fill up just all the particles that kind of miss the letter K or collide with the section where there's particles filled it bounces off or it just flies past and eventually it would just fill up until we kind of shaped uh, the letter and it can give a pretty cool look in certain circumstances that you wouldn't get by you know like doing a magic demon or something it's a different look to it and in the other example there's one additional attribute i want to introduce you to and that is uh, collision tolerance so what collision tolerance can do is just let me create another object here a plane and collision tolerance is a way uh, to kind of have, you know, the default for collision tolerance would be 100% of the particles are going to uh, collide uh, with the surface, obviously. That's what we expect from a collider. And 0% of the collisions are going to be tolerated, if you will. So 0.0 is a float between 0 and 1, this value. And so if you have it at zero, all the particles are not, all the collisions are um, not going to be tolerated. It becomes a little uh, abstract to say it that way, but you can look in the help if you want to. Uh, and if you set it to 0.5, 50% of all particles will go through the object surface. So they will be tolerated and they will be, you know, they will be allowed to pass through. And this is actually pretty useful if you have like liquid lying on a plane or something, if you want to get the effect that is kind of evaporating or something, slowly disappearing, you can have it uh, increase the collision tolerance and it would go through and it would be killed off by a K volume or something like that on the other side. But the thing that I did was just to be able to kind of interactively play with having the particles stuck inside and then releasing as I wanted to. So I would first have it as set, so I would first go back and forth with the emitter, and then I would turn off collision tolerance by keyframing it down to zero. I had it at one initially, and the collider object is set to inward here. 
and then I would keyframe it back down to zero, and then I would switch objects. So I had multiple collision objects, uh, and this was also uh, set to 100% or one set to collision tolerance, and then keyframed it down to collision tolerance to zero, and then all of the liquid that passed through uh, the outside would stay on the inside, and then I would keyframe it back off again or back to uh, zero collision, or I mean 100% collision tolerance with a value of one. So let's just see this in effect. Collision tolerance set to, well, sorry, I'm on the wrong object here. I want them to collide with the plane but escape the sphere. So collision tolerance is currently zero. I'll set it to one and you can see that it's no longer colliding with the sphere at all. Even if I had it set to both, it wouldn't collide with anything. And that's really all there is to that effect. So, I hope you've seen in this little demo or quick tip that uh, sometimes it pays off going back to the standard particles because there's some things that are a little different than uh, Diverso and Hybrido. You are well advised though to have a big slice of patience because uh, just setting this, uh, it was a bit of a shocker. It was a long time since I used the standard particles and I'm going to tell you, uh, it, it, it took a while to, to finish and to get it to the definition that I wanted. Because the more, the more you get up in resolution, I, I don't know if I was at 500 or something for that, the more you kind of want to take it up. Uh, and the default, on the general tab, the stepping here, this is what relates to specifically the standard particles. And the default is 1 to 300. And it's usually on the upper end where it will end up. And as you're simming, and you take it to command line. So one point would be one sub-step, and I'm still doing a fairly easy sim, and especially since I actually keyframed my emitter off, or turned it off. So one point is one sub-step. And I was, as I was doing this, you know, the, the points were kind of going multiple lines, if you will, and that's not something you typically experience with hybrid or diverse. So it can be a little slower, but it can also be a lot more versatile. So I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, create a uh, standard particle emitter and just on your collision object, once you have collected, connected it, play with the collision normal and uh, maybe try, you know, I don't know, an animated character or whatever. Uh, play with the collision tolerance and switch different objects and maybe make something similar to, to what I did uh, in the example before the tutorial. I would be happy to see what you come up with, so uh, don't hesitate to, to share this uh, with the hashtag DaveSplaining or tag me as DaveSplaining on uh, Twitter or Instagram. I would be happy to share your work and spread the word. If you like the tutorial, feel free to share, spread the word uh, and, and share with you know a friend that knows CG and might want to get into simulations or something like that. I'm also looking to getting more into the TD side of things. Uh, there will be more videos on the Node Editor in Maya. There will probably be some Redshift videos down the line as well, and maybe MASH. And uh, if you think there's anything I can improve, then uh, feel free to hit me up in the comments below or send an email to davesplaining at gmail.com um, if you have any questions or whatnot. So thanks for tuning in. I'll be back with another tutorial sometime soon and uh, take care.